Welcome back to part two of this interview with our fake Dr. Jim. I think I want to make it a habit now that the first thing we ask the doctor on air is what do they want their fake name to be? So that that way we're not just like this doc, this doc, you know, I, 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 like, I like calling this guy Jim, you know, he's Jim. He's not Jim, but that's I don't nice like the word doc. Yeah, neither do I. I feel like one of those guys that's like a financial advisor. Hey, doc. You know, I talk to doctors all day, so I just say, hey, doc. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just not that. This is Jim, part two. This is one that, like, I don't think I can fully relate to you, this whole episode from last week. Like, this is a very stressful situation that this guy is in. This is very much a failing startup. I don't think it has as much to do with startup versus an acquisition in this case, as in like a startup done really badly. In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about his diagnosis. You know, he came from a pedo background. The transition to the adult dentition has proven to be challenging for him. A lot of that comes through in this episode. You know, I wonder if there's like a seven deadly sins of doing a startup. Like, here's are all the things to avoid. There's got to be that list out there somewhere. He probably hits like five or six of them. He did Yeah, them. like overspend on equipment, not market. Yeah, just a crazy build out, max out credit cards. You're not leaving yourself any wiggle room. Yeah. Not, not exactly know how to treat the patients he's trying to get. Definitely. I think that's an underrated component to startup is your clinical skills. Because in an acquisition, I think you can ride, you know, I'm waving my hand here because I think you can kind of like navigate it without great clinical skills or without like a diverse clinical skill set is what I mean, not poor quality. And so you know, in this case, a startup, you're like, every patient you have is gold. You need to get as much money out of each one as possible. Um, not ethically, of course. So you need to offer as many procedures as you can. Like, that's the guys that do really well in startups are the guys that do a lot of procedures. And so, you know, this guy's like the polar opposite of that. And so we'll hear about that in this episode. All right. So we were going to talk about your staff and we'll get to your staff. We, we had the story and we were talking about in between segments. So I want you to kind of pick up from that story and tell me what's going on. So I was just saying that, for instance, like I have a lady coming in today star patient i can just tell she's awesome she just walked in off the street she saw our saw our office and she walked in signed up for the membership plan within five minutes of walking in dropped off three hundred dollars she's coming in coming in today she's getting she expressed her desire to get whitening she's coming in today for whitening she's going to pay 350 cash for whitening and she was practically begging me for invisalign she said she wants Invisalign for a tiny little space. It wouldn't even be a difficult case, I don't think, you know, my limited knowledge of ortho. Um, she just wants to close a space on her lower interiors. And I'm just thinking about which orthodontist do I refer her to, you know? I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin to, to, to start this case, you know? How, I don't even know how to get Invisalign going on a patient. I don't know how much to charge. I don't know how much to quote her. You don't know what's fair. I don't know. Do I tell her I've never done it before? Do I tell her, you know, bear with me for a little while while I go get training? Like, I don't even know what to say to her. So are you Invisalign certified? No, I'm not. Okay. Do you have to be to do Invisalign? Yeah, but don't let that stop you. Okay. Okay. I don't don't want this to be a momentum killer. So I want you to do this. Um, first, why did you not feel so initially, you know, you told me that you're like, are we recording? And then I said, no. And then you told me that story. So why, why, what was the uh, hesitation to mention that on air? Well, I just didn't think it was a appropriate time to, to bring it up with the, you know, the questions that we were throwing back and forth. Okay. Well, um, you know, okay. everything is appropriate here. And I, I want you to let your guard down and just let it go. You know, I, um, so Invisalign thing. Um, yes, you have to be certified to use Invisalign. Uh, it's not hard to get certified, but don't worry about that right now. Just tell the patient that there are a lot of clear aligner solutions that can be used mm-hmm. to straighten out her teeth or whatever. And then tell her you'll do it for $4,000. Mm-hmm. And just, you got, I mean, the only thing you got to look for with clear aligner stuff is do they have any major malocclusions, right? Does she have a posterior crossbite? Does she have anterior crossbite? Do I have to move a tooth in a way that's going to be like an against an occlusal relationship? Like, do I have to move a tooth from being lingualized in occlusion to, you know, like those are the hard things. But if it's simple tooth movement, you know, there are a million companies that do labs that will do aligners for you. Like, it's not hard. You should go out of your comfort zone on this case. The patient seems like a nice person. This is kind of the nice case. Like, is that her only expectation is to close one space? Yeah, she just pointed to me a, a open space on her lower. Looks like it was in her K, canine area, just a little gap, two millimeter gap. And she said, I really want to do something about this space. And uh, just, you know, my 
not knowing any better, I kind of started talking about maybe doing a, a build up to, to build it up with composite or, you know, but I, I did mention it probably wouldn't look right if we did that. Um, and she, sure. and as soon as I said Invisalign, she got excited, you know, in your mouth, what would you do? Invisalign. Okay. So that's what you're telling her, mm -hmm. right? You got to start thinking that way because the reality is they're coming to you not to see what they can afford and recommend something that fits their pretend budget. They're coming to you to find out what you would do. Mm -hmm. You know, you're the expert. Right. And so, you know, in this case, yeah, just tell her, you know, we'll do it. It's $4,000 and, you know, take an impression, send it to a lab and just make sure you understand her expectations. Just clearly understand her expectations, take some photos and, you know, call up, you know, I, after air, I can give you some recommendations and you can do clear, correct. They don't require you to be certified, but I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do clear aligner therapy um, that don't require Invisalign certification. And so long as you understand her expectations, so she wants to close this space and that's it. And then you take that to your lab and you say, she wants to close that space. And then they say, okay, we will close that space. Then that space will get closed. Then you're sort of just monitoring the case and, you know, putting on whatever buttons and, you know, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. So yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it. She's coming in this morning. So we'll, we'll yeah, have that just conversation. Say, say you were looking into it and, you know, you found out that you could do some clear liner therapy, take some photos and some impressions, you know, $4,000 fee. She can pay that in payments if she wants. You know, I don't care. You can figure that out. I mean, I think that would be fantastic for you to start to get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like, I hope listeners aren't like getting mad at me for being like a little bit too, I don't know, just go for it. But the reality is the clear line art therapy is like the perfect thing to just like, so long as there's nothing major, just go for it. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what? It takes a few extra trays to get the result you're looking for. You know? So long as you clearly understand their expectations, you know, all I want is this space closed. If you close that space and everything else looks like shit, she's happy, mm -hmm. you know, and don't know, don't point out any of her other flaws, you know, just point out the space, you know, cause right. if you point out other stuff, you're going to be fixing other stuff, you know, mm -hmm. just keep it simple. Go for it. I'd be really happy for you. If you close that case, that'd be awesome. Okay. I'll let you know how, how it turns out. I think that's a perfect example of treatment philosophy, confidence, like, you know, try to learn, try to, learn about the adult dentition, you know, what things you need to be looking out for. Uh, because it's funny, you talked about the cracked amalgam, a not diagnosis. If a patient comes into my practice with an occlusal amalgam with a crack on the mesial and distal marginal ridge, you know, before they even see me, that is made to the patient as a big deal. And I view that as a big deal, you know, but you don't. And that's fine. But I just, I just think, I just think that it just, it's just different. And I think you just need to get used to the difference. Yeah. Well, I mean, it shows in my, it shows in my production reports, I'm sure. So. Yeah. And but, you know, I'm not saying like, again, you're not going to go from 10 to 30 a month just by treatment planning differently, but I think 10 to 15 a month would really alleviate a lot of stress in your life. Oh yeah. Um, that extra five thousand dollars would then allow you to market and allow you to get some momentum going, and like there's there's things that we could be doing with more money. Um, so anything, I mean, again, I mean the same way I said ass on fire with patients, you know, getting patients in the door. I said ass on fire with your diagnosis. Like everything you see has to be mentioned. This is a, this is a game of numbers, and you need to shoot as many shots as possible. Mm -hmm. Like. You know, I, I hate that stupid sign that you see in classrooms where it's like you miss all the shots you don't take. But the reality is, yeah, you're missing all the shots you're not taking, you know. And mm -hmm. I think that's just – I had this uh, this coaching client. I, I don't know if you listened to his episode, but he had this practice where he was seeing like, like a couple hygiene patients a day. And he just did everything. He did their endo. He did their extractions. He did their, you know, he's like, I have time. I might as well. Like if, if there's an extraction, you don't feel confident in your ability to deliver. You could tell the patient like, look, you know, it's going to take a while. But if, if you feel like there's a chance you can take it out, you know, like obviously if it's like way out of your comfort zone, don't do it. But, you know, you have a lot of time. And the reason why we refer things out is because they take a lot of time or we don't feel that we can deliver a good result. If you can't deliver a good result, don't do it. But if you just feel like, well, this might take me a bit then say, tell the patient, like, I could, it could take me a bit, I could do it, or you could be referred out, what would you prefer? Mm. 
some people prefer to stay in and have it be a longer appointment. I mean, I think you just need to start stretching your comfort zone in all areas uh, right. because you have an excess of time. I mean, I would I would rather you sit there fiddling with a molar endo for two hours than I would have you sitting there doing nothing, talking to me for two hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought I've been really comfortable with surgery. Um, I think I kind of got myself into a, um, a little a little fear and trouble. It was actually my very first wasn't my very first patient, but one of my first five patients uh, who was actually the project manager for my construction project. And she had a um, abscessed endo treated tooth that needed to come out number 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did an exam and we saw, uh, you know, she didn't have the opposing upper tooth. And so I said, Hey, let's take it out. You know, no big deal. It's, it's easy, you know? And uh, I've always been thought I've been comfortable with surgery. <clears throat> So I went after it and, uh, not thinking, you know, just, you know, just not thinking that it was an endo treated tooth, not thinking that it had a giant buildup on it. And as soon as I went to elevate, I mean, the whole thing just fractured at the gum line and, uh, kind of got traumatized because I had to send her to the, you know, oral surgeon, um, at another, she had to drive a couple hours to get to the surgeon, um, which was closer to her home. And, um, you know, it kind of traumatized me a little bit. So after that, I've kind of stepped back and, you know, kind of thought about, you know, is it in the patient's best interest for me to attempt this if I can just send her down the road and have a surgeon do it in 10 minutes? Um, so is that patient mad at you? She's not. Not that I'm aware. No. Do you think she would come back? Um, I think she actually stuck her head in one day. I was busy and she stuck her head in to say hi and uh, i did treatment plan some some fillings on her and she mentioned that she needed to come back and get them done i don't know if she was you know being serious about it but not that i'm aware she's not mad she didn't leave a bad review or have it you know but it was just kind of <laughs> yeah just, it's it traumatizing it so yeah it so is. do you want to hear about my first extraction yeah, let's go. Let's do it. I have this oldest older gentleman. He's been coming to the practice for 30 years. He golfed with my cellar. You know, he's uh he was my hygienist high school teacher. You know, this guy was this guy was like a, you know, really solid, well-established patient for the last 30 years. And uh he had a broken number 5. And um same thing. I sent him out mid procedure. You know, mm -hmm. and then uh he comes back in like 2 months later with number 3 broken off. And he, he was talking me into referring him out before I even started the procedure. You know, I wasn't even going to do it, but he's, he was like, nah, I don't think, you know, it's broken. It's <laughs> tough. You know, just send me back to where you sent me last time, yeah. you know? And, and, and then he came back and we placed his implants and restored them, you know? So like, it's, it's big deal for us. Cause it's embarrassing. You feel like you're caught with your pants down, but you know, this is one thing that Matt helped me realize was it's not a big deal. Like it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if, if we're not going to do stuff because of that, then like you're holding yourself back. I mean, you're not going to get any better. You know, it happened once, you know, try to learn from it and try to figure out, okay, you know, it's like a game film, right? In that situation, what did you not do that you could have done differently? So, you know, my guess is, you know, sectioning the tooth, troughing some interceptal bone and elevating out those roots, you know, you probably could have gotten it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what you did or didn't do, but I'm just saying that like maybe post on one of the Facebook pages with clinical stuff to try to figure out, well, what's my next step in that procedure? Um, because, you know, my guess is that you're better than you think you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and the patient's not mad at you. Nothing happened. Worst case right. scenario wasn't even that bad. She's coming in to get feelings then, you know, so what really happened? Nothing. Right. And why did she go a couple hours away to an oral surgeon? Well, she lived in another the next city, next town up, a bigger city. So she was kind of driving. Went, yeah, so she went to the oral surgeon next to her house. It was convenient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no biggie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you got time. This is the time to improve clinically. When you're busy and it's going to hold back your whole day if you get stuck during an extraction, that's the time where you don't want to be doing them. You know, but now's the time to get better at extractions. Mm -hmm. And then are you offering your patients bone grafts? Oh, no, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, man. So, um, oh, gosh, I don't want this to get too clinical because it's, this is not the purpose of the show. Um, right. But they have these things called osteogen plugs. Uh -huh. They're like 50 bucks a piece. And you 
you just shove them in the extraction site. It has hydroxyapatite and collagen mixed in together. Like, and it's super easy. They're like 50 bucks a piece. We charge 400 bucks for a bone graft. It's like the easiest money after an extraction. It takes, you know, you rinse the socket out, you, you cure at it, and then you just shove it in, suture on top, and you're done. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. So get yourself a pack of those. You know, use okay. your marketing budget one month to buy <laughs> yourself some bone graft material. Um, because, you know, those those will be, that's easy, and that's like an entry-level bone graft. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think in general, it's just, it's it's clear to me that, you really need to spend some time on adult treatment planning, clinical philosophy, what's best for the patient. Because the reality is 18, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you as a dentist. Don't take it that this way, but you know, number 18, you know, extracting that tooth surgically without a bone graft, um, you know, you're going to have some root loss on the distal of 19. So even if they don't want an implant, if they don't have an opposing 15, keeping that bone level will improve the long-term prognosis of 19. And so if I explain to a patient, hey, look, there's going to be a humongous hole in your bone if once we take that tooth out and if I can keep the bone where it is, even if you don't want an implant, that'll help the tooth in front of it. Most patients would be agreeable to a $400 bone graft. And um, for me, that's that's just what's best for the patient. Um, so I think it's just like in every facet of your treatment planning, that confidence, the reason why we're doing it and the confidence to do it is just uh, – it's just – you just need some some time and some research to kind of get your knowledge base up. Right. Yeah, I just hope I don't, you know, just don't want to flop in the meantime trying to get that knowledge up, you know? Well, what do you mean flop? Well, I just mean just, you know, let's say my associateship, I'm, I'm just thinking hypothetically, gets upset at me for, you know, I start seeing Medicaid kids or I get fired or, you know, whatever. And then I'm stuck here at at my practice making, you know, 6,000 a month when I have a $20,000 a month overhead. I guess that's like my worst fear. Um, Rightfully so. I've actually, I've actually reached out to a couple of um, other potential job opportunities, trying to expand my adult clinical knowledge you know i've reached out to a few emergency clinics um a few other places but i've realized george that nobody wants to touch me once they hear that i have a private practice um they just all of a sudden they they move on you know they 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 don't really want to you know dentists are weird you know what an urgent care what about don't you have a local urgent care I, I've try, I tried to, to reach out to them um, and we had a great conversation and they were ready to, for me to come on board. And, you know, I wanted to be honest because I didn't want to quit my associateship and then start working at an urgent care center. And then they find out I have a practice and then they fire me that I'm, you know, stuck without a, without a part-time job. So I sure. told them on the front end that I have a private practice that I'm just looking to supplement some income and they never, you know, never responded back to me. Um, so, um, even, you know, talk to a couple of adult Medicaid clinics so I could get some surgery experience, maybe some endo. And, um, again, they just, you know, don't want really to seem to have anything to do with me. What about like a Saturday? There's a lot of places that look for just a Saturday doc. Are you, would be willing to work a Saturday? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I would say keep looking for that, um, but I don't let that take away the focus. You know, like I kind of like that. Oh, shit, if I lose my associateship, you know, this isn't going to be good for me. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of need that ass on fire. You know, I just so yeah. I mean, if you do lose your associateship, yeah, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, you know, because I looked at your your stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like. This is this is not a recipe for this is not sustainable for a while, but the associateship makes that possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you lose that associateship, and yeah, you're definitely in trouble. So right. you know, you need to get this practice turned around quickly so that you're not at the mercy of somebody keeping you as an associate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I feel like I am. I am right now. Um, yeah, and, and, that and I'm, goes ready, back. I'm ready to move on. You know, I'm, I've, yeah. I've kind of learned all I can there uh, doing Medicaid pedo. I'm kind of tapped out, so I'm ready to you know, do something different. Um, but it's just kind of feel like I'm kind of stuck there, you know, uh, kind of afraid to just cut that, cut that tie 
and 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 go all in because it just almost seems like financial suicide to do that. It is right now. Right. Yes. Yeah. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you need to be hitting thirty thousand dollars a month before you do that consistently. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That you need to be triple what you're doing right now. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Before we get back to the episode, I wanted to take a minute and thank Practice by Numbers. Without their help and allowing us to set up the Shared Practices dashboard, a lot of what we do on Practice Underwater wouldn't be possible. I want to take a minute and highlight a clip from the episode that we did with Rohit, where we highlighted some of the metrics that really matter most. One of my pet peeves that I want to share is that when you talk to some of the providers that are really successful out there that have been in, in practice for 20, 30 years, and they roll your eyes when they when you say you're going to manage by numbers and this and that. They have successful practices. They have built them, and they have something right they have done. And when they tell you the only thing you need to look at is your bank account, it's absolutely incorrect. Okay? It pisses me off every time I look at that and I see that comment on the, on the Facebook group because success is not happenstance. It just doesn't happen. It's kind of baffling. It's an everyday kind of thing where you're you're striving to improve, you're striving to tighten your systems, you're striving to know your practice better. And just to get in that kind of complacent mode is easy. I can see how it happens, you know, because you get, you're so in the wheel and you get over, you know, overwhelmed with things that you just, this isn't something you want to think about a lot of times. But, you know, it really is so important that, that people focus on this kind of thing. I hope you guys enjoyed that clip. If you guys are interested in trying out Practice by Numbers and looking at your practice through the Shared Practices dashboard and their many other dashboards, you can go to practicebynumbers.com and set up a free trial. So let's talk about your staff. So okay. in the email, you talked about um, you know some leadership type stuff, and um, you mentioned you're one employee. So kind of go through with me, you know, that situation. Um, yeah. So. My one employee actually um, works part. I've been working with her for on and off for five years uh, at the pedo clinic. Um, she's she's been a pedo assistant with me, and um, I was able to, like I said, you know, they really wanted me to stay there. I'm a higher producer, so I was able to steal an assistant, for lack of a better phrase. And she came with me and. Um, and she goes with me two days a week to that office. Um, I've actually cut her down to one day a week now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I can't really, you know, it's just getting, a, it's it's becoming a lot. So she goes with me one day a week to that office. And um, she's with me the other, you know, the days that I'm here. And so we've been working together for a while. She's an awesome, you know, she's an awesome worker. Um, but she, I need somebody that really can think you know, for me at times, um, someone that's going to take some initiative and, you know, help me market and help me come up with ideas. Um, you know, that I, I literally have to tell her every single thing to do. Um, I feel like, or it won't get done. Um, I feel like I have to clean up behind her. Sometimes I feel like I have to check in to make sure that she made the phone calls that I asked her to make. Um, and she even describes herself as shy, you know, so she's not, really <clears throat> um outgoing to the patients i kind of have to coach her into what you know what to say to the patients what not to say to the patients you know hold the door open for the patients greet them uh, when they walk in the door don't say hi do you have an appointment you know um greet them by name so almost it, it's a lot of stress on me to um feel like i'm holding her hand in a sense because she comes from a medicaid pedo background as well you know she'll she'll work all day you give her a list of tasks to do and she'll get she'll get them done um but she doesn't really take much initiative um to to kind of think outside the box and help me come up with ideas to grow the practice okay so a couple things there um do you feel like it's her job to help you grow the practice um no I don't, um, like I, I, I don't, it's, it's, I feel like it's my job, you know, but it, 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 it's a lot of stress, you know, having to, it is. To, 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 it, it is a lot of stress, it's a lot of work. That's why you get paid the big bucks. <sighs> you know what I mean? You know, when, when this thing gets rolling, you know, she's going to continue to make what she makes. And the whole idea is that you make more because mm-hmm. that's your job. 
Well, I think right now she might make more than I do. So <laughs> she definitely does. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, I guess I, I wanted to understand that you said she makes between four and five thousand dollars a month. Yeah, I, actually, I pay her twenty three dollars an hour, which is a really high for our area. You know, I've never met an assistant that makes over. 17 18 and she's actually expanded functions um so she you know she's able to do a lot but i'm not really able to use utilize her in that capacity because it's just her and i at the chair it doesn't really make sense for me to get up in the middle of a procedure and have her jump over and restore for me um why not I've, i've done it a couple of times um but you know i wouldn't so i look at it like this i wouldn't want to restore personally without an assistant chair side and so what am i going to switch over and be her assistant it doesn't really seem fair for me to make her restore without an assistant or without somebody helping if i wouldn't do it myself so i kind of just stay in my seat and just do all the restoring have you asked her that question um no no Ask I, her think, that question. I, well, I think she's comfortable she's comfortable doing it but yeah um, you know, in my mind, I kind of feel like maybe the patient might get a little subpar treatment, you know, if, if I do that. So I haven't been really doing so that. So the patient's going to get a subpar treatment from, from the fact that the assistant is placing the composite? Yeah, she might, she doesn't have, you know, maybe it gets contaminated or, you know, um, not really there to guide her. You know, she's used. I use her at, we use her at the, at the pedo clinic and, you know, we, we utilize expanded functions there and, you know, mostly they're just putting in amalgam or stainless steel crowns. Uh, we don't really do much composite. So, um, you know, I'm trying to, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it, but. So I, I think you're holding yourself back because you don't feel that she can place as quality a composite as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably true as well. So I think she could do a decent composite, but probably not. I don't think it's up to my standards. So I have two EFTAs, expanded function dental assistants, and I, they place better composites than I do. So when I have, when an assistant places a composite in my practice, the patient is getting a better service than when I place the composite Mm -hmm. for sure. And I'm not like bad at placing composites. They're just spectacular. And so there's either two things going here. One, you might not realize how good she is. Or two, um, she's not that good. <laughs> and you, we need to figure out which one it is. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So once, say you have like a really chill patient, you know, something easy where you don't think they're like not the annoying, you know, a one for you, a low stress appointment, right? Patients easygoing maybe somebody in their 20s getting some occlusal fillings or whatever. I don't know. Whatever is an easygoing appointment for you, just say, okay, go ahead and fill these and then look at them. Right. And let's start to assess where she's at. Okay. And maybe talk to her first. She might be a little confused. And just, you know, because re- realistically, when you get busier, it's not sustainable to not use your staff to their fullest abilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're paying her to be expanded function. And I mean, the reality is you could leave – and try to do something more productive because her job is not to be a self-starter. Her job is to do her job, mm-hmm. you know, and your job is to be the self-starter and to do all of the the growing of the practice and the moving of the practice and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's the one thing that I, I would like to challenge you on. The other thing is have, have you communicated to her the expectation that when a patient comes in, you say hi or whatever? Yeah, we've had that. We've had that talk. Um, I think another thing that I might have mentioned to you, you know, when I reached out was, um, you know, I don't want to spread her too thin. She's my, sure, I could find another assistant, but it would probably be a scramble to, to get one. And I don't want to spread her too thin. She does a lot. You know, she's, mm-hmm. um, you know, she's my only assistant. She cleans, she's chair side, she, you know, presents finances, she verifies insurance, she answers phones. Um, you know, she restores on, you know, at at certain times, um, she checks inventory, she does sterilization, uh, she does a lot, you know, and I don't want to, uh, I guess part of me is afraid to 
upset her, even though she does make pretty good money. I don't know that she could make that anywhere else, but maybe she could make up for it in time. If she goes somewhere else, she's going to get more hours. So maybe she does make more money. Who knows? But um, I guess part of me doesn't want to stress her out and cause her to want to leave, which may or may not be a good, you know. Have you had that conversation with her? Um, no, not, not in those words. I haven't. Why not? Um, I don't know. Probably need to have that talk. Well, I kind of know why, because it's vulnerable, right? You don't mm-hmm. want her to know that you don't want her to leave and you don't want her to know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, you know yeah. 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 You don't want to be vulnerable. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You want to make it seem like you're confident, you have it under control and things right. are, you know, the reality is that, you know, she needs to be let into a little bit, you know, so like a patient walks in the door and she doesn't say hi, right? Like that's a, that's one example of it. You're thinking about it of like, we don't have that many patients. The ones that we have, we have to give a spectacular experience to because otherwise, you know, we're kind of screwed, you know? Mm-hmm. And from her standpoint, she's like, this guy just keeps bugging me to tell me these things. But my guess is if you were to flip it around and sort of let her into your reasons why. So I never start with, whenever I tell a staff member to do something, I never start with what I want them to do. I always start with why I want them to do that thing. So like, let's talk about the high example, right? Patient walks in, you say, I really want our patients. So right here, you know, tell her, Hey, you know, staff member, my pay, you know, we don't have a lot of patients. Like we're actually like, barely scooting by and we need to, you know, I really feel like it's important that we give patients a great experience because we don't have that many of them. We need to maximize the ones that we got. And so the way we are going to do that is, you know, and so I think she needs to be on board with that reason. And Mm -hmm. then the, the delivery of the, the request is a lot easier for her to satiate because she understands the reason. My guess is she thinks that you're annoying because you keep pestering about these small things mm-hmm. um, when, in fact, these small things matter. Um, but I think she, it's just you have to communicate the bigger picture first. So um, – and you, I think you, your relationship with your staff, especially if it's just one, has to be very close. Like you have to tell her, like, look, I'm worried that I'm overworking you. Am mm-hmm. I overworking you? Mm-hmm. And I don't want you to leave because I'm overworking you. Like mm-hmm. that's a very vulnerable thing to say, but it shows you care. So right. if you're just overworking her and not saying that, then she thinks you don't care. Um, mm-hmm. But if they know that you care, that's a big deal. Right. No, that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Like if I'm working for somebody that's, you know, really working me to the bone and they don't care, that's worse, mm-hmm. you know, but if they care and they feel bad, but they can't afford somebody like, you know, then the empathy comes in and then it's easier to do those things. And you get that staff member who goes above and beyond, you know, to me, she sounds like a rock star, you know, she's, she's doing everything for you. You have like one staff member who's like two front desk an assistant, you know, and probably is willing to go out and, you know, close the office one half day a week and go out and market with you, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, it's up to you to think of those ideas. That's not up to her, but if she ever does think of an idea, take it, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but just let her know, you know, I want your ideas, but if you don't have them, that's fine. That's my job. Right. Right. No, I think you're right. I mean, she's really good at what she does. She's a great, she's a great assistant. Um, you know, but I just don't know if I'm, am I, am I asking too much of her? Am I, you know, not, should I be expecting her to do more? I don't know. It's probably my, um, kind of my dilemma. That's a question you need to ask her. Right. Am I expecting too much of you? Um, do you want to place fillings? Is you know, like ask her all these questions. I mean, mm-hmm. there. I mean, there's just two of you and no patients there. I mean, you guys need to be doing something. I mean, have a conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you right. know, I mean, you have all the time in the world to have that conversation and really build that connection. Um, that's very very important. You know mm-hmm. because you know, they have to know that, you know, like you have to know, like, and trust them and they have to know, like, and trust you, you know, so definitely have to make sure that 
you know, because you don't know, she could be feeling those things or she could not be feeling those things. Um, but you have no idea because you've never asked. Mm -hmm. Most likely because you're afraid of the answer. Right. Right. I think probably in my mind, you know, I just know her personality as being so reserved that, you know, even if she do, did feel overworked or overwhelmed, maybe she, I guess in my head, I, I kind of have the conversation without her that she would, she wouldn't admit to it. Um, that she would just say, oh no, you know, it's fine. No, no big deal. You know? And so I kind of just avoid it. Okay. So let's do that pretend conversation, right? So I'm you and you're her. Okay. So I'm okay. telling you, you know, let's just call you, I don't know, Susie. Um, you know, one of, you know, I'm unable to have a large staff because I don't see very many patients as you've probably seen. And one concern I have is that you're being overworked and, you know, I don't want you to leave because I'm putting too much on your plate. So do you feel like I'm spreading you out too thin? So what, what do you think she would say to that? I think she would say no. Okay. Oh no, not at all. Okay. And then say, well, you know, I've noticed that you are shy. And so I just want to make sure that you're not just saying that to not hurt my feelings or not make me upset when the reality is I want to know how you're actually feeling. Mm -hmm. So if you ever do feel like you're being overworked, you can come talk to me and I'm not going to get mad at you and we'll talk about it and we'll work through it so that you can feel like you can stay here for a long time because I want to work with you for a long time. Right. That's fair. I think it's a fair assumption. So yeah. whatever it is you're thinking, you have to say, you know, so if, if you feel like she's too shy and she's not being honest, you got to tell her, I think you're being too shy and you're not being honest. Mm -hmm. um, and just let her know that th she needs to know that you're not going to get mad. Right. Do you ever get mad at her? No, I don't. I'm not, not, not really in my personality, you know? Yeah. I've noticed. She, she, um, she could, she could drop my into world camera and I think I just, Hey, it happens, you know, and she has. Yeah. And <laughs> that's know? fine. You know, that's how you want to be. Your staff needs to know that it's safe to come talk to you. Yeah. So yes, that is a positive thing. And that needs to be, you know, she needs to know that if, so then let's just say she comes talks to you. Right. And she says, Hey, you know, I feel like uh, there's too much on my plate, then I would ask her, okay, well, what, what can we take off your plate that would mm -hmm. make you feel better? And what if she said, you know, I don't know, what do you think she would say if, if you asked her that question? What is one thing that she would want off her plate? Um, maybe, I know she, she doesn't feel comfortable talking to insurance companies. I know she's kind of hesitant. She says she's a little shy and she doesn't like it. Makes, stresses her out, she says, when she gets on the phone with insurance companies. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Okay. That might be so something. then how about when she places your composites, you talk to the insurance company. Okay. You see what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's a situation where that would mean a ton to her because mm -hmm. now she's having more fun clinically. She's doing what she feels that she's able to do. Like right now, I think she feels like she's not doing everything to the fullest of her abilities, right? Right. Like – if I worked at a place and they said, if I felt comfortable doing extractions and they're like, you can't take out teeth, that would mm -hmm. feel annoying. Right. You know, that's, that's kind of what you're doing. Yeah. I, I think mean, that is, that is her comfort zone is to, to be restoring chair side. That's where she's yeah. comfortable with what she's always done. So pretty much every responsibility she has here is outside of that comfort zone. You mm -hmm. know, she's not used to cleaning. She's not used to sterilizing, sterilizing. She's not used to negotiating with insurance companies or presenting treatment. You know, her comfort zone is restoring. And I just feel like I can't really utilize her to that capacity right now. Yeah. And the reality is that you can. Um, but like, there are some things that you just can't do, right? Like you can't, I don't think it's appropriate to present finances to a patient. You know, maybe it is in some cases, but you know, like I think for the most part, that's her job, right? Um, but maybe there are some things you can't take off her plate. Like I think it'd be good for you to talk to insurance companies and learn how that whole thing works, mm -hmm. you know, because if you have time sitting here, you know, if she's placing your composite, then you could be talking to the insurance company mm -hmm. and alleviating her stress. So, you know, I just think that you guys can negotiate some solutions together so that she's happier. And um, I think she needs to have the confidence to tell you. That's the biggest thing. Because you have a great team member. And I think, um, I think she's you know, a long-term fit. She's been with you for five years. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's, she places composites, you know, when, once you start taking Medicaid, that's going to be something you're very happy about. 
is that you have somebody who's, you know, able to do that, you know, so try to think a little bit long-term and you see how she fits in long-term is probably very well. And so, you know, we just need to get her there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a yeah. uh, quick question, not a huge deal. Are you reappointing all of your patients for their next cleaning when they're in the office? We try to, we try to, um, for the most part, I think we are. I mean, there's probably a few that slip through the cracks, um, that, that we don't reappoint. Um, but I, I guess maybe 80% we're probably reappointing right now. I don't know what that number looks like on your end, but. So that number looks like about 80%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, that's solid, mm-hmm. right? So once month seven comes around. You know, have you been doing that since day one? Yes, we've been trying to. Yeah. Okay, so once month seven comes around, you'll start seeing your recalls, okay. and that'll that'll be nice and helpful for you. So I, I think that's, um, you know, you're in month five, so a couple months away from you know a nice little boost. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. But you know, I think you know let's kind of wrap this whole thing up here. Um, I I think my biggest. You know, I just am amazed at how not urgent you feel. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I kind of want to, if anything, I want to kick a sense of urgency into you that you don't have time to dick around and wait for this to grow slowly. Like, you kind of need to get this thing moving, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And that comes into patients through the door. And when they're there, you need to have confidence in your entire treatment plan and your treatment planning skills, for sure. Okay, right. Do you have anything that you feel like we did? Well, how do you feel? No, I, feel like, I feel good. I feel like there's a few things that I could work on. You gave some good advice. You know, I feel like I have a few areas that I can, you know, focus on and improve on and have a few conversations. And um, I think they'll, I think they'll benefit us a lot. Okay. And is there anything that you feel like I didn't address? That's a problem that you'd like to discuss while we have some time? No, I think, I think it was pretty helpful. Everything was pretty helpful. So I appreciate it. Okay. So I want you to really like, let's put your priorities, right? Number one is your ground marketing. You know, you need to contact Groupon, you need to contact Living Social, you know, you need to put out the whatever is going to get people in your door. Mm -hmm. Because an empty chair is so much worse than somebody in your chair. So Groupon is a free thing. It's free marketing? Groupon, they pay you to see patients. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like the most attractive form of marketing in the world but i mean it'll get you a solid 10 people a month okay. you know and um you're gonna so the way it works is and you're gonna hate me for this but you, you're gonna put up a deal like a 39 dollar cleaning or something <laughs> okay? okay and wait it gets worse and a groupon is gonna take half of that oh great and so you're gonna be seeing a patient for a cleaning exam and x-rays for 19 dollars oh that sounds exciting yeah I'm not kidding. Okay. I'll look into so, it. So now, um, how does that sound? Well, um, I, like I said earlier, you know, um, my biz, biz, biggest expense is not having a patient in the chair. So, you know, any patient is better than no patient right now. Yeah. Um, and you so. can cut the group on when you, you know, but you just need anybody. Right. right. Like think of any way that you can get anybody. Like if there's a fair you know, you go to the fair and you set up a little stand for your office and you hand out stuff and you try to get patients. You try to mm-hmm. schedule them right there. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to a business that, you know, maybe their employees don't have insurance. You talk about your in-house plan. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you go to a, a company that you take their insurance and you talk about your office. I mean, you got to, you have to, like, I don't know. I'm not a ground marketing guy. Like for me, the idea of going somewhere to try to get patients is like, just not me. Um, right. But the reality is how I feel, but I, you know, I know I could probably do that a little more. Um, well, you don't have a choice, right? You know, I think that's sort of what I want you to realize is that, um, you really have to, mm-hmm. like, you're not in a position to like your associateship is really covering just, you know what I mean? Like it, it mm-hmm. kind of is, is a, you know, I think you need to, you need to kind of accept the fact that this might be a little bit, um, more in the red than I think mm-hmm. because what happens, you know, when, um, you know, these expenses, like what is your, is your lease? Was it full payment from month one that you were open? 
Uh, month two, it was, yeah. We, we killed most of our free rent during the construction overages. Um, but yeah, month two, I started paying. And so what about your bank note? When does that kick in in full? Um, sometime in 2020. I don't have the exact month, but probably let's say maybe six to nine months, it's going to kick in in full. So you kind of don't have that much in, you know what I mean? Like y- y- mm-hmm. you're in this situation where you have this cushy associate chip, you, and I'm not saying it's cushy in the lifestyle. You're probably there, you know, really busy, but you know, you make good money and it's, it's kind of covering some, some issues for you that, you know, are going to get louder and louder as time goes on. Mm-hmm. So I, I really want you to have that sense of urgency that you need to, um, do anything way out of your comfort zone to get patients because right now you have to. Okay. And you need to diagnose everything you see because right now you have to. And, you know, once you get some money from the practice and you get some things going, it all goes into marketing. Like until you are $10,000 plus in the black, you know, it, you need to be investing back into the practice, into marketing and getting people to the door. Okay. Yeah, I'll work on that. No, it's really helpful. I appreciate it. Like I'm, I'm trying to shake you here and like, you know, um, because I want you to, I want you to feel the urgency that, you know, we'll get this thing done. Like the Medicaid stuff has to be done like that. That's, that's probably going to be the biggest impact financially for you, Mm -hmm. especially with your expanded function assistant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where she's, she loves kids. You know, she's super comfortable seeing kids. So that'll help out a lot. There's this thing where adult practices will have a Medicaid column. Mm -hmm. So, they'll just see like one Medicaid patient every 90 minutes and they'll just do everything they can on that Medicaid patient. And it's just like a, like an extra hygiene column that you kind of run. And mm-hmm. especially with an expanded function assistant, it works well because you just go in there, prep leave, you know, and it's like a very simple and um, that can fit into any type of model. You know, you just throw it on the side in an extra op and it produces a supplemental hundred dollars an hour or so. So that's something that could be nice for you down the road to just, keep the Medicaid thing. It's just part of you, right? You're never mm-hmm. going to not have Medicaid experience. Mm-hmm. So you have a Medicaid assistant, you have, you know, just that could, you could grow into that. So there is long-term Medicaid has a long-term role in your practice for sure. Right. You know, even if you have like a fully booming adult P- adult PPO practice, you know, you mm-hmm. still, you still have a nice Medicaid component to it would be nice. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't run away from it entirely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of going back and forth about if I even wanted to to do that, which is why I haven't probably why I'm not credentialed yet. So um, I think I'm at the point now where I realize I kind of need to not give you that. Have to. Yeah. have to. You don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. You you have to do everything possible to get. P- I want you to get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm seeing so many patients that I need to start focusing on the ones that are making me money. And then we can cut the group on the living social, you know, and then tone down the Medicaid. But until then, I mean, you, you, I mean, anybody is better than nobody. Right. You can't continue at this pace. It's not sustainable. Okay. Well, it's good to hear. Good to hear from somebody else besides my own head. So. Again, I'm very impressed with like, you know, how calm and cool and collected and, you know, I just, I'm just kind of enjoying the journey, you know, it's been, it's, it's been fun, you know, just building this thing and getting off the ground and, you know, it's, it's, it's been a blast, but now I'm at the point where the, the bills are just really kicking me and I'm just like, Oh man, what did I do? You know, what's going on here? So it's kind of at the, I can't no point of no return at, at this point. Yeah. Right. Like you're at a point of no return, right? There's, you can't sell your practice for what you bought it for. You can't like, you know, you have to make this work, mm-hmm. you know, and, I think you just need to own that level of urgency and know, again, what do I have to do, right? I need to, one, get patients any way that I can. Two, I need to really spend a lot of time looking at literature and learning about how to treat the adult dentition because, quite frankly, you know, that's holding you back. Mm -hmm. And then three, you know, you need to just appreciate your staff member and also, you know, work on building that vulnerable relationship with them because that's that's where you get you know great performances when your team feels cared for and trusted and secure you know and that that's what you need to do right no that helps a lot 
All right, man. Well, it's been a pleasure. And um, do you have any anything else that you'd like to mention on the show before we stop recording? No, I think we're I think we're good. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you coming on. You know, I, I uh, anybody listening. So I always anytime people send me an email for the show, they always say I'm not sure if this practice fits the bill for the show. Any practice that is <laughs> willing to be vulnerable, honest, and open, and talk about what's going on mm-hmm. in this safe place is a candidate for the show. Mm-hmm. And you're a perfect example. Like and, we and, built and, the show for you. Yeah. And Hey George, I, you know, I know we're anonymous here, but you know, if anybody's, you know, would love to reach out and ask me any questions or is kind of in the same boat and is afraid to speak out or reach out, you can give them my contact info. I'd love okay. to talk to anybody and just tell them all the mistakes I've made, what not to do. So i uh, be happy to. What's your fake name going to be? I'll let you pick it this time. What do you want your fake name to be? We always do a fake name and the editors always pick it. Oh man. Um, Jim. You can be Jim. <laughs> all right. Okay. So this is Jim. And if you want Jim's contact info, then reach out to me and I'll hook you up with Jim. It was awesome. nice talking to you, Jim. <laughs> hey, thanks, George. I appreciate right. it. We'll it's talk fine. soon. Thank you. All right, Matt. So last week, or last guest, I guess a couple weeks ago, you know, I kind of called you out for having the inner George in you showing through your hygiene delegation discussion. And so this was my inner Matt coming out where very much the effect that you've had on me in our time together uh, of, you know, diagnosis and presenting things to patients and not being afraid of failing. Like I, if you, in that episode, you'll hear about that example with the extraction where I asked like, well, what happened with the patient after that? And then I kind of talk about that story about, you know, my extraction where we ended up doing the implants. The ex- the reason I asked that question is because you asked me that exact same question. You're like, so what happened? And I'm like, well, he came back and did two implants. You're like, okay, so then what was the big problem, you know? And so it was pretty cool to like get to be Matt for a minute and like say something that he said to me in this context. And um, so this was very much an interview that I think strengths of mine are not strengths, but things I've improved on because of you have really shown up. And so I, I want to hear your your take on it. Well, I'm like tearing up here, George. So thank you. That was very nice of you to say. Um, I think your very inner man is very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah. I mean, this is this is right up my wheelhouse. Like the whole can't get the tooth out. Got to send him the surgeon. I'm never going to try this again. Like this was so traumatic. I'm a terrible dentist. I don't really know how to do this. I'm doing patients disservice by offering this this treatment in my office. Like that is just like something you can't, you just can't allow yourself to fall into. You can't make it mean something about you when you can't get a tooth out. It's just something that happened. You know, these things happen. We're we're treating teeth. They're not, you know, this is an exact science, you know, things go wrong. Um, And in most cases, patients are fine with it. You know, they understand as long as you, you know, admit what happened and, and you tell them, you know, hey, I think the best thing for you is to have this other person finish this job. I'm very sorry. I could not get this out for you. Uh, I'm here for you going forward, whatever you need. You know, it's all in how your being is with the patient. If you're presenting that to them, it's going to be like this guy. She pops in to say hello. Like who pops into a dental office like when they don't have an appointment to say hello? I've never even heard of that. Um, <laughs> so like... It just I want to normalize for the audience. Like this happens to every every dentist out there. I I fail at something at least like it feels like weekly, it's probably monthly, but like all the time I'm like trying something that doesn't work out and I'm having these conversations and it sucks, but it happens and it's it's not gonna stop me from trying these things again in the future. So we talked about my special sauce during my interview. That is your special sauce. Just your ability to degaff you know, when things don't go well, you know, and just not take it personally is hands down the most impressive thing about, you know, my time with you. And I think, you know, for us, my favorite part about doing the show is, you know, as much as I like the, the guests and everything, I think it's the, the conversations that we have about our practices and the honesty that we get to have back and forth that I think grow us both. And I mean, if anybody wants to recognize a strength in Matt, it's that, I mean, he'll just talk in him will just make you more able and willing and confident to take on stuff that you should be doing. Um, but like you're for some reason not doing. Got any more? I thought I was enjoying that. I was just, I was, yeah, I know it it is fun. It is fun getting compliments from your co-host. Um, I, that's all I got right now, Matt, but when I have another one, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. Please let me know. Like as soon as it comes in your head, just like, Um, what what did you think about the, what did you think about my suggestion of 
sort of writing down, that was an exercise that I like doing with clients where you kind of take a list of everything you treat and like, it's very unusual, but then you start finding stuff that you probably don't mention or you don't notice or like, you know, and doing research and like, why do I treat that? And really feeling confident in the diagnosis that you make. Like, what did you think about that whole thing? Yeah, I love that idea, especially with someone who currently isn't feeling comfortable with diagnosing things on the adult dentition. Like first writing it out and kind of going through it like a checklist, you know, not actually bringing the checklist to the, to the checkout, but, uh, you know, studying it and learning it until it becomes second nature. And then you get in that routine, like you said, you know, 15 to 18, 31 to, you know, you don't even have to think about it going forward. So that he needs to start from square one where he's, he, you know, doing some research, going on the spear, get the free articles, whatever it is to get more knowledge. He needs knowledge right now. He yeah. needs knowledge about different treatments. You know, what happens if you don't do certain treatments, you know, the risks involved, like he, he needs some training. That's what this guy needs. And, and once he gets that going, I think he'll find diagnosing just to be second nature. Like it is for a lot of docs. You know, and I think um, that's kind of the value of metrics is like, so that's, a, that's something in my wheelhouse as a coach, but I don't do that for every client. Kind of like what you said, right? I do that for the clients in which, you know, I see, I see kind of crown hunting is what I call it, where you just see like such a large percentage of their diagnosis is from just like one or two procedures. Like you know? we, we both had, had Justin as a coach. He went over yeah. with you. We never talked about that. Yeah. Like definitely that was a big part of my coaching. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, you know, like I think that idea that this guy is so cash flow strapped and then for him to be in that situation where he says, you know, to a patient, you have wear. All right. Fun fact. High five about your wear. And then let's just move on with our lives. Like, you know, he needs, he needs to treat everything and he's not treating anything, you know, other than obvious caries, which is like kind of a, I don't want to like stereotype, but that's like a pedo Medicaid, like way of treatment planning, right? Do you have any decay that's going to like abscess this tooth? No. All right. Well then like, you know, we can pretty much take care of it next time. And George, I knew you're an NBA fan, and I also knew without you telling me that you were going to be one of those nerdy NBA fans who looks at like effective field goal percentage and like DVOA and like you know all the nerd stats. So I love that my like thought of you was spot on. Like, <laughs> um, what did you think about the analogy though? Right, because I mean it was beautiful. Like he he's trying to hit he's trying to hit all singles. Yeah, baseball guy, but he's trying to hit all singles instead of like swinging for the home run and getting it less often, but still coming out ahead as far as like, it's a much uh, higher cost treatment. And then in the reality, like we'll probably talk about this every time we talk about diagnosis. It's not like basketball or baseball where you get a finite number of at-bats or shots. You know, you get to shoot as many times as you see a shot. Anytime you see anything, you get to diagnose it. And, you know, it's not like if you diagnose a card on that patient, you can also diagnose an eye card or, you know, like, so it is in your best interest to put the odds in your favor by putting out as many things as possible and helping patients in as many ways as possible. Like that's a, I love in the industry, I am unwilling to sacrifice ethics for financial reasons, but whenever you can find a chance to help somebody and make money, I always take advantage of those situations because that's just in your best interest and their best interest. That's like a win-win. And in this case, you know, that's what it is. Yeah, for sure. And he, you know, he is so stuck in, like you pointed out, in his comfort zone with diagnosis. And it's like getting him to expand beyond that. You know, possibility lies outside of your comfort zone. And if he if he's staying in there, there's no possibility. He's the doors are closed, you know, in short order. Um yeah. so like I said, getting that knowledge for him is gonna be super important so that when he's getting more people coming in with the with the increase in marketing, he's gonna be starting, you know, m- at least getting on the path to maximizing their appointments. Definitely. Um, I liked how you got into a lot of things with the, with the assistant and that mm-hmm. unpacking that relationship, because I think, I think at this point there isn't much relationship there. You know, it's, it's very much like he's walking on eggshells with her. He feels like just the boss and she's the employee and he's you know afraid she's going to leave and, you know, doesn't want to upset her and, and make her feel overworked. And I love how you went through a little bit of that role play with, with him and, and how he could present things to her. Um, so, so kind of shed some light in, in that and how you present things to your employees. Yeah. So I think one of the big things that I'm, I always ask my clients is when they're talking to me and I'm vulnerable with them and we're like a vulnerability is kind of like a, 
you know, for me, that's the expectation. Anytime I'm working with a client, like we're both vulnerable with each other. We're both honest. We, none of us lie. I don't, I don't embellish my accomplishments. Like we just are the way we are. And it's hard sometimes to do that with your staff. And so like the idea for him is I always find that vulnerability is the best way to approach people about things that are uncomfortable. So he's uncomfortable about the fact that like, what is this assistant's job satisfaction right now? You know, and if he were to just be super vulnerable and just say, Hey, you know, like I'm feeling very nervous that you're going to leave me because you're such a valuable member of my one, t- one team member. Like you're, you're everything. You're my whole team. You know, I don't want you to leave. Like start with that, you know, start with the reason why I always start with why. And so if she can get on board with that reason, like, okay, that's why, like, I'm on board with that. Like, I want him to not want me to leave. Like, oh, she's on board with all those things. Then anything else she says, anything else he says will be inherently correct. And so, like, it seems like he's afraid to have that conversation because of what she might say. And I think a lot of the times you'll be very surprised as to what your team actually says. You know, like, if you ever want to make yourself uncomfortable, I did this once. And I can tell you it's incredibly uncomfortable. I walked into my office. And I asked my key team members, not all of them, I asked my key ones, is there anything I can do better? And I just didn't say anything. They talk about a nerve wracking thing to do, right? Like that's and one moment of silence where they're like caught off guard and they're thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, they're caught off guard and like, hmm. and then like, do you want me to be honest? I'm like, yeah, you know, and that's how you grow. And so, but it's, that's like a super vulnerable thing to do. And, you know, like he, he, he just is it's just an untrained thing to be vulnerable with your team like that, but you have to like, you have to be vulnerable with them because that, I mean, that she, she probably thinks he doesn't care about her, but the reality is that he really does. And, um, you know, for him, if he were to come up to her and say that, my guess is it'd be a much different conversation. than if he were to come up and say like, why aren't you taking on a more leadership role or placing my composites or like whatever he was going to go with, you know, like I think the other comment I had was you cannot delegate leadership people when they try to delegate they try to delegate their job it's like dude no you got to delegate the parts of your job that are not your job not the parts of your job that are you know like i'm, I'm not going to go to my staff members say you know like where are we going to be three years from now like work on that let me know what you come up with you know it's like that's my job you know their job is to do the day-to-day and get us there but it's my job to kind of be the one guiding the ship and i think his frustration with her from a lack of taking ownership of the marketing or whatever it was that he was upset about was very much out of line. That's, that's his job. He is upset at her for not doing his job. Yeah. It, it goes back to his laissez faire, just attitude about everything. It's almost like um, he's not taking personal responsibility for, for this office. He's kind of like just hoping it'll kind of grow organically or hoping his assistant will kind of help out with the growth. He's just not taking ownership of what, where the office is going, which at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's him. It's all starts and ends with him. It's, you know, it's like the, the uh, the book extreme ownership it's like it's all about you at the end of the day um yeah. and you can't be expecting a team member who is already wearing you know 10 hats in the office to also be focusing on the vision of where you guys are going yeah it's like what are you doing you know and um i think that idea that everything is your fault is something that dentists in general have a hard time with it's easy to blame like if i just had a different assistant doing everything, it would just be so much better, you know, but it's like, no, that's your fault. Like a different staff member won't change the boss and the boss is the problem. It's always a problem. So did you have anything else, Matt? I just want to see some urgency out of this guy, man. I want to like take him, give him a nice shake, like a little shaking. And then maybe he like wakes up. I mean, how many times did I say ass on fire in this interview? <laughs> I, I don't know how else to impart that. I mean, that was like my whole interview was trying to get this guy to realize that this is urgent. You know, this is like a very urgent situation. Like, ass on fire, dude. Like, yeah, yeah it's show him the gif of the dumpster. It's like live look at this guy's practice, that dumpster on fire. So that's it. I mean, I think he'll, I think this will be a big help. And I'm really glad that you're you're kind of following up with him and giving him some guidance um, going forward because I, I know he needs it. And uh, I'm hopeful. That's yeah, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. You know, I think it's very interesting, um, but you know, we'll follow up with Jim and we'll see what happens. Thanks for listening to another episode of Practice Underwater. We'll see you guys next week. If you're interested in one-on-one coaching with either Dr. George Hariri or Dr. Matt Garino, our contact emails are in the show notes. 
And if you're interested in being on Practice Underwater as a guest, where we can look at your practice anonymously, you can go ahead and contact the email in the show notes and follow those directions to get on the show. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week on Practice Underwater.